Clavicle fractures, this is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series version 5. Slides are by Dr. Gudrun Muller, and I'm Sakib Rahman narrating. So the objectives are to understand deforming forces in the anatomy, uh, affecting clavicle fractures, uh, discuss factors affecting decision to treat fractures operatively versus non-op, and uh, evaluate different operative techniques available. So these are 2.6% of all fractures. Um, they happen in higher energy injuries, uh, like motor vehicle, uh, collisions, collision sports, um, football, hockey, cycling, very, very common, um, and will, uh, happen usually in a younger population. So the demographic skews a little bit younger, although there is a second peak later in life as we get older, um, but generally younger patients. So uh, the clavicle is, to some extent, a strut for muscles to attach to. It's not a weight-bearing bone for most people, uh, but it is the only connection between the axial skeleton and the upper extremity. So a lot of muscles um, kind of hanging off of it, so to speak. Uh, the shape is flat medially uh, la um, and laterally, where you um, kind of have to get a model in your hand to get a good look at it. Uh, Laterally and medially, cancellus or locking screws will work a little bit better. In the central section, it's a little bit more tubular where you can use cortical screws. Um, it has a flat superior surface and is somewhat S-shaped uh, as shown here when viewed from above. It has articulations at the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints. And there are quite a few uh, deforming forces. So uh, muscular um, uh, anatomy that you should be aware of uh, shown nicely here in two different views. This is from Rockwood and Green. You have the sternocleidomastoid that covers the medial 60% of the superior surface uh, and it can pull the medial sec um, segment proximally, right, which is frequently what you see. Uh, the deltoid covers a lateral 40% of uh, the superior surface and holds the distal fragment stable. Uh, the trapezius is kind of posterior superior. The uh, pectoralis uh, is also here, originating from the anterior inferior surface, as shown uh, over here uh, in this uh, diagram on the right-hand side. And um, the uh, subclavius is kind of the muscle underneath that protects the neurovascular structures. So uh, neurovascular uh, concerns, the, uh, superficially, you have the supraclavicular nerve, um, and uh, this is uh, something you have to be aware of when you do operative dissection of these as well. Um, this is providing sensation uh, over the area. It runs vertically. So again, if when you make surgical incisions this way, you have to look for these branches. Uh, frequently, they end up getting cut on approaches to the mid-shaft clavicle, uh, and sensation often improves over time, but doesn't always completely resolve. Um, deep structures to be aware of are the subclavian vein, subclavian artery, uh, and at some point, the brachial plexus. Look at the, um, the uh, vascular structures a little more here on this um, sagittal view. The subclavian vein is directly beneath the clavicle, separated only by the subclavius muscle. So you can kind of see right here uh, how close it is. And, and those of you who have put in central lines will know that a lot of times um, when you go here, you kind of bounce off of the clavicle and then direct inferiorly, and then usually you go into it. So just think about that when you're, when you're operating and fixing on these, especially if they're late fractures and you're digging out um, adhesions and scar tissue. Um, the subclavian artery is a little bit more posterior. Uh, it's protected by the scalene muscles. And the brachial plexus is um, also posterior, closest to bone in the mid portion. So mechanism of injury for mid shaft fractures uh, is typically a lateral compression. Uh, resulting in bending and axial load, so sort of a, you know, a fall directly onto the shoulder, or you can see with this yellow arrow shown here. Um, the uh, thinnest portion of the bone and mid shaft typically will fracture, has fewer soft tissue attachments. 
Uh, distally, um, these also happen from a fall typically, and sometimes you'll see these at a little bit more older and lower energy, uh, older patients and lower energy injuries. Medial fractures are fairly rare. Um, usually it's from a high energy direct blow uh, to this area here. So classification, AOOTA, uh, and then the Robinson classification are fairly similar. Uh, you have a medial fracture, you have a diaphyseal or mid-shaft fracture, and then you have the distal fracture. Um, and that's a simple way to think about it. There are a couple of ways you can also think about distal fractures, depending if you're um, lateral to the um, ligaments or not, uh, originating on the coracoid, and that can make a difference in treatment. So associated injuries are uh, rib fractures, proximal humerus fractures, basically other fractures in the same vicinity because these happen typically from a direct blow to the lateral shoulder. Um, chest injuries can include pneumothorax. Uh, if you have a glenoid fracture and a clavicle fracture, you can have so-called floating shoulder. Um, so here you can see there's a clavicle fracture here and a glenoid neck fracture here actually scapular body fracture as well. So this patient has a so-called floating shoulder. All right, let's talk a little bit more about mid-shaft fractures specifically. So that is our uh, mid-shaft fracture as shown in our AOOTA classification uh, on physical examination. So we already talked about history and injury patterns and mechanism you want to look for. On physical exam, you want to look for overlying uh, abrasions, um, careful that the medial fragment can buttonhole through the platysma. Uh, you want to look for deformity, as shown here. Uh, is there a droop? Is there so-called skin tenting? Um, so you want to look for that. Uh, on uh, radiographs, you want to consider uh, getting upright views. The reason is because Sometimes if you're supine, you may not be able to appreciate the true disformity when that patient is upright. So it's not even really a stress view or having to hold weights or anything like that. It's just how that patient is going to look and what the fracture displacement is going to look like when they're up, sitting up or standing up. And that's something that we often don't uh, look at when you have inpatient um, trauma patients um, so they may get a supine view, and then that's the end of it, and then they come to the clinic and realize, wait, it's a lot more displaced. So a lot of times you have to make sure if it's an inpatient, at some point you get an upright film. So here you can also see they're showing you how to get a uh, standard AP, um, and uh, here you sort of have your um, cephalic view, right, or Zanka view. So... With this view, so it's not you know it's not exactly orthogonal, but I mean what you're doing is you're trying to get a somewhat different projection by shooting um, cephalad with your imaging, uh, and hopefully these are upright views. So uh, when you're talking about operative versus non-op for a mid-shaft clavicle fracture, um, we'll get into this a little bit. And one of the conversations to have is you know if the patient's worried about cosmetics. Uh, we often will say, well, I mean, we'll have to trade a bump for a scar. Uh, that is, if we have to go in and fix these, there'll be a scar, there'll be implants that sometimes may bother the patient and need to be removed. Um, and uh, But if you don't treat these and there's significant displacement, I mean, that can lead to a, a bump. And in some cases, not just a bump, but um, significant shoulder droop as well um, when the patient looks at themselves. Uh, or other people are looking at them or when you examine them in the office. So um, you have to think a little bit about shoulder function. Uh, is this person who has to um, do a lot of overhead activity? Um, does that play a role, perhaps? Um, Non-union, are there any factors that you think are going to uh, put this patient at significant risk for non-union, perhaps with fracture gapping or displacement, or maybe patient-specific characteristics, and so we'll get into that. Associated injuries, polytrauma, right? So does this patient have a floating shoulder and perhaps, or have, you know, multiple other injuries and could benefit from operative fixation rather than being in a sling. So um, 
Shoulder function with non-operative care can do well uh, in the uh, study above. Motion is, they, they demonstrated that motion was preserved. Uh, there was significantly reduced strength with max uh, endurance, uh, inflection, abduction, external rotation, internal rotation. Um, so the uh, there was some residual disability, but they didn't really tell you the, the amount of shortening. Uh, in the second study, this is a longer-term follow-up, a little bit of a more recent study, and um, about one centimeter shortening, good follow-up, uh, not a lot of patients, no significant long-term deficits in strength. So literature is a little bit unclear. Um, the landscape of management fractures of the mid-shaft clavicle have changed, I would say, since uh, 2007. So uh, you may want to uh, look this up. This is a paper from the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, and that was uh, JBJS uh, 20, I think 2007, um, and it's by the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society. I think they're listed as the authors. And this is a this is a um, this is a randomized control trial, and uh, in that particular study, they did find that um, operative fixation of displaced clav mid-shaft clavicle fractures did result in improved outcomes, functional outcomes, um, as well as lower rates of malunion and nonunion compared to non-op management at one year. Um, so there, there certainly has been a shift um, to more uh, operative fixation of clavicle fractures since then. Um, and the pendulum has swung perhaps a, a little bit uh, back and forth, but that is a paper you should be aware of. Um, Non-union risk, um, it's if you have two centimeters displacement, you'll see that quoted often in the textbooks as a um, uh, indicator to consider operative management. Um, fracture comminution. Uh, in the clavicle fracture, in a mid-shaft clavicle, because of the deforming forces we talked about earlier, you often get so-called uh, Z-fragment. Now, this is just comminution, but what happens in the clavicle is you get this sort of, and it's not as pronounced here, you get you get this sort of Z configuration where you have the one fragment here, you have the comminution or you know, inter intervening fragment here, and then you have this here. So it looks like a Z in many cases here. You see that fragment, although it's not making it look like a Z. Um, this is also considered to some extent a non-union risk. Smoking um, has been shown to be a non-union risk here. You can see it increases the risk three times in a non comminuted fracture. Now, how symptomatic a non-union is, is another story, um, but... Um, Certainly, you want to be able to assess is you know, and tell your patient like you know what's the risk of this just not healing. Severe chest wall trauma, right? So you, you'll often have associated injuries. We talked about this before. Um, if you have a vascular injury requiring repair, if there are multiple other injuries in the same area. Clavicle repair might be indicated. If you have scapula thoracic dissociation, which is a very rare traction injury in which you can have a very distracted clavicle fracture. Uh, these are cases where there probably is some vascular and brachial plexus injury that needs to be addressed as well, but uh, skeletal stability and restoration of anatomy with fixation is often indicated. Floating shoulder um, has been considered to be an indication for operative fixation. Um, and in many of these cases, fixing the uh, clavicle alone will be sufficient uh, to get the glenoid into a reasonable position um, and at least provide some stability. And for most surgeons, it's a more familiar approach and uh, uh, can be more readily uh, done by more people. So polytrauma in general uh, is often a, a relative indication for operative fixation of extremity fractures in general, clavicle included, give them back an arm to use. So rather than keeping them in a sling, uh, by fixing their clavicle, they may be able to more immediately use that arm uh, and that can facilitate their physical therapy and mobilization. Uh, what about returning to work? Manual laborers, pro athletes, this is a question. Um, it has been shown in some studies that some pro athletes will return to sport faster. Um, that is, uh, 
you know, if they need to, you know, get back again, come out of a sling, get back to playing sooner. Um, of course, there are some risks of uh, re-injury and refracture, and certainly the fracture is not going to be healed in two weeks. Um, but uh, uh, they may be able to function a lot sooner, as you can with operative fixation of many fractures. So, what are some of the options? Well, there's plating, superior versus anterior. Um, we're not going to get into all the nuances of this. Uh, there's also um, you know, single versus dual plating. There's intramedullary fixation. X-Fix is also out there, although not popular in the U.S. Um, so uh, intramedullary fixation um, is an option. In the middle third of clavicle uh, fractures, you have an intramedullary canal. Uh, it is uh, something you can instrument. This is um, in, in a simple fractures that are not comminuted or length stable. Uh, this can be a nice option. There are some commercially available products for this uh, that have some interlocking. Um, there are some specific pins used, um, like a rockwood pin, uh, for clavicle fractures as well. It's hard to really lock in rotation um, and uh, you know, if you use a non-locked implant or just pin it, it can migrate, so don't do that uh, in general. Um, but if you're going to do intramedular fixation, there are some devices specifically for this. All right, let's pause there, and then we'll pick up with uh, some more fixation techniques from mid-shaft clavicle fractures, and then we'll round out by talking about um, medial and lateral fractures to finish out the next video. Thanks.